Hi, and welcome to our talk on data portability between online services. Imagine the following scenario. You're a long-time user of an online service, like a social network or a file hoster. Over time, you have accumulated a lot of data there, and now you'd like to switch to a new, cooler online service. However, you're hesitant to do so because transferring all that data from the old service to the new service is just too much work. Privacy regulation, like the European Union's GDPR, promises to make this process much easier. But how well does it really work? My name is Emanuel Semudis, I'm a PhD student at the Technical University of Munich, and in a team with Stefan Mager, Sophie Kübler-Wachendorf, Paul Pizzinini, Jens Großklax, and Johann Kranz, we've empirically analyzed how effective the right to data portability of the GDPR is as of today. When analyzing data-driven markets, we often see the same pattern. There are one or very few dominant services who gather a lot of data and have no incentive to share that data with other services. For a market entrant, it's very difficult to establish themselves in the market as they just lack that amount of data. Data portability regulation now wants to make it easier for these services to gather the data as it is easier for individuals to transfer their data from their old service to the market entrance. We therefore want to find out how well data portability currently delivers on this promise to allow individuals to transfer their data from one provider to another. Therefore, we look at three different sub-questions. On the one hand, we wanted to find out what scope of personal data do online services provide to individuals when they request a data export. Then, which op options do online services offer individuals to import their previously exported data. And in a, on a more general view, how quickly, securely, and to what level of compliance with GDPR Article 20 is personal data transmitted to individuals? The GDPR became effective in May 2018. And this is the first time that a data regulation explicitly contains a right to data portability for individuals. In the GDPR, the right to data portability is defined in Article 20 and contains two subrights. The first subright allows an individual to request a copy of their personal data and to receive that data themselves. The second subright allows an individual to request a data controller to directly transfer that data to another service. However, this second subright comes with a limitation that is, it can be requested if technically feasible. As of today, we see that other privacy regulations also have adopted a right to data portability, for instance, in California, in Brazil, or in India. Article 20 contains some requirements on how a data export has to be provided. Namely, the data has to be provided in a structured, commonly used and machine readable format. That is, if you request your data from a service provider and they just send you a screenshot of your database entries, this data is not in a compliant format. Wong and Henderson have studied, studied multiple data formats uh, in which are compliant or not compliant with the right to data portability in 2019. And they have found that especially CSV, JSON and XML are compliant. However, even if let's say JSON is used for a data export, the data can still be unstructured if all the data is contained as plain text in one key value pair. However, let's say these formats have the potential to be compliant with the provisions of Article 20 GDPR. Another important aspect of data portability is the scope of data provided in an export. The Herd et al. define four different types of data. On the one hand, there's received data, which is data actively provided by the user, for instance, a post on a social network. Then there is observed data, which is data that's still provided by a user, but in a more passive way, for instance, locational data gathered by their smartphones. Then there's inferred data and predicted data, which is data that is produced using received and observed data to learn something about a user, for instance, uh, they have listened to these songs on a streaming platform and now 
with a certain probability they might want to visit a concert. The Herr et al. argued that there are two interpretations of the right to data portability. On the one hand, a narrow interpretation where a service only has to include received data and a wider interpretation where the service also has to include observed data in the data export. As of today, there's no functioning infrastructure for directly transferring data from one data controller to another. Therefore, in our study, we focused on so-called indirect data portability. That is requesting a data export from one controller, for instance, Facebook, storing it on the own computer, and then trying to import it uh, at another controller, for instance, Mastodon. In our data set, we therefore have different aspects of this data transfer process. On the one hand, we have data on the export requests. We have data on the import capabilities uh, of online services. We have the Alexa ranks of all services uh, to have a proxy for their popularity. And using NACE industry codes, we created, a industry, we created industry categories in order to be able to classify the services. We couldn't use uh, any of the classical existing industry classifications as they just turned out to be too outdated. For instance, classifying Facebook just as other information service. So now on the data collection itself, we requested a data export at uh, 182 services in total. The sample here consists uh, of personal accounts of the author that were already existing when conducting the study. And in addition, we uh, checked the German Alexa top 100 ranking and added missing services to make sure we don't uh, miss important services in our sample. Where possible, we then uh, exported the data via uh, the web interface of the service. If that was not possible, we wrote an email to the uh, data protection officer or the customer support and requested an export of our data under Article 20 GDPR. As the table on the left shows, our sample consists of a pretty good mix of both popular and less popular services with regard to the worldwide Alexa rank, which then allows us to analyze whether these services have any differences in their data portability practices. Regarding the data import options of services, we looked at a sample of 190 services. Here we first identified each service's core functionalities. For instance, for a email provider, this could be storing emails and storing calendars, for instance. Then we checked each, inspected each service in three different ways. We inspected the web interface if there are any options for importing data. We inspected the help files and documentation of the services if we find any instructions how to import data and we used search engine and search for how to import data at these particular services. And in addition, for each service, we gathered whether there are single sign-on options uh, via OAuth. The next table gives a brief overview on the measures used in our study. So for the export requests, uh, we have data on the export scope, on how to request the data export, how to authenticate in order to receive it, how it was transmitted, and how long it took until our request was completed. We further have variables on the overall compliance with Article 20 GDPR. And on the import side, uh, we have data on the scope of the possible import and if there were any options to uh, use OAuth to transfer data. We further have data from the Alexa database and Orbis database in our data set. In order to analyze the data, we've developed several hypotheses on the data portability practices, especially of popular versus less popular services. We've based these hypotheses on, the, on existing economic models on data portability, which essentially say that market entrants or less popular services profit from data portability and therefore have a higher incentive to, to use data portability. Our hypotheses therefore are as follows. We assume that more popular services are overall more compliant with uh, Article 20 as they fear higher fines. Then we assume that popular services export data with a smaller scope in order to be less usable. We assume that popular services require more authentication steps to make it more difficult to receive a data export. We also assume that 
popular services take a longer time to make uh, until the export is completed in order to make it less usable. And we assume that less popular services uh, have more import possibilities in order to make use of a right to data portability. Let me first show you some descriptive results. Out of the 182 data export requests, 45 could be made via a dedicated request button. 23 services offered a dedicated request form and the other 114 services had to be contacted via email. In the end, 135 services answered our data export request with a average export duration, that is the time needed uh, until the export was completed, of 9.5 days and a median duration of four days. In order to provide the data export, a majority of 77% of services required one or more authentication steps. The most frequent one was requiring the user to log in to their account with 52% of services did. 24% of services required to click a link in a confirmation email and 4% of services even required to send a copy of an ID card. For the transmission of the data, we see very mixed transmission ways. The most frequent one was sending a download link in an email. Often the data was also sent as an attachment in an email. Taking a closer look at the actual data exports, we find that 51% of exports are in a GDPR compliant format. Most often exports are in a CSV or JSON format. Regarding the export scope, we find that 62% of services not only include received, but also observed data of the user. In addition, 9% of experts even include inferred data. We further analyzed the overall compliance of services with Article 20 GDPR. Compliance here means that a service has delivered the data export within the legally permitted timeframe of 30 plus 60 days that uh, the data export was complete, that is no received data of us was miss missing in the data export, and that the file format was machine readable, structured and commonly used. And overall, we find that only 29% of services in our sample were compliant with the terms of Article 20 GDPR. When analyzing the import capabilities of services, we find that a large majority of 77% does not offer any import possibilities at all. That is for these services, there's not even a theoretical chance to import data previously exported at one of their competitors. One notable exception is the survey marketing and web analytics uh, industry sec sector, where more than two thirds of services offer at least some type of import possibility. In order to test our hypotheses, we've used audit logic and OLS regressions. Let me highlight the three most important results here. Regarding the GDPR compliance of services, we find that more popular services indeed export their data in a more compliant format. However, regarding the overall compliance, uh, we cannot see a significant effect. Interestingly, for hypothesis two, where we assumed that more popular service export data with a lower scope we find the exact opposite effect. More popular services export data with a richer scope. Similarly for hypothesis five, where we assume that less popular services, which do want to make use of a right to data portability, offer more import possibilities. Exactly the opposite is the case. More popular services offer more import possibilities. As seen on the previous slide, we find that more popular services both export data with a higher scope and give better options to import data than their smaller competitors. One could argue that small services regard data portability more as an obligation and do not see that much of a chance for growth in a market in it. The question is therefore, why is this the case and how can data portability become a more successful user right than it is today? In our data set, we found two examples where we think that a successful data transfer from service A to service B is al already possible today. The first example is the finance industry, especially banks. And the reason here is 
that there's simply a stricter and even more precise regulation than data portability, which forces banks to allow an easy transfer of accounts from bank A to bank B. But we've also seen services from the fitness industry where apparently there's that much of a self-interest to collect as much health data as possible that these services offer comprehensive import possibilities as well as comprehensive exports. Instead of rather complicated indirect data transfers, one could also implement data portability in a more direct way using established protocols like OAuth for single sign-on. Regarding OAuth, we find that 45% of services in our sample already offer one or more single sign-on options. One could argue that this also constitutes some kind of data portability as there is a transfer of personal data to the service offering single sign-on taking place. However, these transfers usually consist of a very limited amount of personal data from either Facebook or Google. There are also two-way solutions under development, for instance, the data transfer project. However, these solutions are not yet taking place. Our study leaves multiple questions or challenges open for future work, which can help data portability to become more successful. On the one hand, we need to know when data portability really is needed by consumers. Then how to encourage uh, services to really offer data imports. What fraction of data is really useful in terms of being reused by another service? And finally, how can this whole data portability process be standardized in order to be more usable than it is today? To wrap up, our study finds that even two years after the GDPR entered into force, there were still only very limited options for data transfer through the means of indirect data portability. Surprisingly, we also find that the popularity of online services has a positive influence on both the scope of data exports and the data import options that are made available. Let me conclude with possible limitations of our study. As explained in the method section, our sample partially consists of services where we as the authors already had an existing account and therefore, therefore is a partial convenience sample. We would of course love to see our study replicated with a different or even larger sample. Then to be able to compare services across industries, we could not directly use an existing industry categorization as they are heavily outdated and therefore had to create our own industry categorization based on NACE. This highlights the need to update current industry classifications to reflect the diversity of today's online markets. This concludes our talk. Thank you very much for your attention.